So actually, it's a, it's a great honor to be on stage here with the two people I respect greatly. And uh, I want to comment on what they've already said, so I can't because I've got to do my talk. Um, so I want to talk to you about the Africa that we envisioned five years ago and how much faster it accelerated to us than we thought. I spend my time looking around um, and, and, and following the innovation in Africa. So many times it looks like this. It's guys coming up with businesses and kind of stuff on the side of the road, and they're, they're hacking what they have. It's ingenuity born of necessity, that kind of thing. They make their own welding machines, but they also make their own home security systems with 4,000 volt shocks if you don't turn it off in time. <laughs> This is at Maker Fair Africa this last year in Kenya. And this uh, young man from university had built this device because his, uh, his home was broken into one day and he had all this stuff stolen, including his TV, which is a, his most prized possession. So he then set about making a system that, he, that had 11 phases of security on it that could be started and stopped using just an SMS message. And there's hundreds of them. Right? We did Maker for Africa in Ghana two years ago. Last year it was in Kenya. This year it'll be in Egypt. And, and you see these guys come out of the woodwork. And the most interesting thing about it is that you see somebody who runs a business on the side of the road at a table next to a university professor. And they're both equally ingenious. Um, one of the things that I do, and I, I want to flag it here, is we run the Innovation Hub in Nairobi. Uh, uh, it's, it's a place of over 3,000 uh, tech community people from Nairobi, and it's got, a, it's got a, just a lot of critical mass. People come in and out of there all the time, international and local, uh, and it's really taking off. And it, it allows us to kind of get a, a bird's eye view and also a close-up view of what's going on in, in the country. And we've also, uh, we're about to launch the M-Lab, the mobile lab in East Africa. Uh, and this is an incubation space for companies uh, who are starting up in uh, mobile apps and mobile services. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, three things. One of them is mobiles, one is bandwidth, and uh, one is community. So this is the default device for Africa. Uh, many of us know this already. Uh, it's, it's no surprise anymore. We talked about the numbers. But what's interesting is who's doing it, right? This is uh, a picture of, uh, of the CEO of Virtual City who won a $1 million Nokia investment last year. He went up against people from China, South America, North America, Europe, uh, and he won. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a testament to the quality of work that's coming out of Africa, too. And by the way, Virtual City, what they did is they created a, a mobile and web-based uh, and, and computer-based service for um, uh, tracking supply chain, so management, management of your supply chain. Here's some numbers for you. Just for, I'll just give Kenya numbers, because that's what I know best. Uh, that's where I live. Um, there's about 9 million internet users in Kenya, 22% of the population now, okay? Two-thirds of that number is only accessible via, uh, they only access the internet via their mobile phone. 99% internet via mobile phone carriers. Holy cow. So the ISPs that you hear about, they hardly, they hardly even scratch the surface, right? The operators are the power. 90, 92% of them is just one operator, Safaricom. That's another story. All right, so there's a... This is, the last number is phenomenal, right? 843% mobile internet growth predicted by September of this year, okay? In a 12-month period. That, that, can, that kind of goes to show you, of course we started with less, so the number can be big like that, right? But it's, it shows you how much growth we're seeing in mobile internet usage. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paper coming out tomorrow um, at the London School of Economics about uh, bandwidth in, in around the world, and especially in Africa, though. And here's one of the numbers in it. And you can see you know, where the predictions are for total fixed broadband. You know, see that little tiny little snub, nub of a number there next to mobile broadband, right? And you see how important the mobile phone is to Africa. Um, this is one of the, th the, the numbers that I really like. Uh, and, and I think it was February, uh, Safaricom, uh, Huawei, and uh, Google kind of helped launch a new phone. It's the IDEOS uh, phone, and it sells for about 90 US dollars, uh, and it's an Android phone, fully operat operational Android phone. Uh, the battery life sucks, it's only like four hours, but it's, it's actually a touch phone that you can use just like you would use your expensive iPhone or something like that. And, They've sold 60,000 of them in Kenya alone to date. 
They've ordered another 200,000. Um, so let, I, we talked about five years ago, so let's go ahead and look at Kenya five years ago. Just really quick, I'm gonna run through these. So five years ago, we had eight million subscribers on the mobile, app, on the mobile networks, now we have 22. 19% uh, of coverage of the, com of the country, 87 now. Uh, text used to cost five shillings, now it's one shilling. Uh, cross network, cheaper. In networks, cheaper. This is what the coverage looked like then. This is the coverage now. Uh, cyber cafe used to be five shillings a minute and now it's 50 cents a minute. This is a dying business, don't get into cyber cafes. <laughs> uh, you know, cost of ADSL, expensive, satellite. I mean, just, there was no M-Pesa five years ago, right? And now Africa, not just Africa, Kenya leads the world in mobile payment solutions. And there was no 3G data, and now all major cities have it. So it's amazing what has happened. And it, and it makes guys like Steve Mutinda here uh, able to do things that he couldn't do before. Steve Mutinda is, and now he's 26, he was 23 when I met him, mobile phone uh, application developer, did J2Me apps, built, and he was building things like this is, a, uh, you can't see it because it's out of focus, but it's, uh, it accesses the Nairobi Stock Exchange, and so people can have it on their phone, they can check what their stocks are during the day. All right, so let's get on to broadband. Broadband's an interesting one, because uh, with broadband you see a huge, a huge growth. And I'm gonna run through some slideshow, um, a slideshow done by Steve Song, who really tracks this the best. His website is minipossibilities.net. You should definitely read it. Okay, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2009, 2009, 2009, 2010, 2010, 2010 still. This is today, okay? Now let's look at the future. So this is next, uh, this, is the, this is later on this quarter, this quarter, end of the year, beginning of next year, and, uh, and mid next year. So we're, we're getting to a level where we have as good a broadband as you can find anywhere in the world. And what does that mean? What's gonna happen? Well, the answer is we don't know yet, right? And so I'm gonna talk to you finally about what I call the, pyra the innovation pyramid. Innovation pyramid is, is easy to see if you deal with places like I do, like the Innovation Hub, right? Because what you see is you see guys like Karanja Macharya, okay? He's been around for about 10 years in this space. So he runs a small to medium-sized business, works with all the mobile operators. Google bought some shares in his company about three years ago. Very successful, right? He carries around a Nokia 1600, the cheapest uh, kind of mobile device that you can you access the data network on. So he, and he does it so that he can see what his customers use. So he's a smart CEO, right? Um, one of the numbers that he realized was that 40% of mobile phone uh, users in Kenya don't keep any credit on their phone. So they can't actually access any of his services, right? So he's looking for ways to zero rate that, right? And we saw, and the funniest thing is we saw last year, the only company to think about this and actually act on it was Facebook. They did Facebook Zero, right? Facebook Zero, you can go there for free, don't have to have any money on it, and they work out the deal, just like a normal ISP and website relationship you'd find anywhere else. Uh, and he's doing that kind of stuff as well. What, what he understands is that there's a paradigm shift. Uh, there's a paradigm shift in the way the entrepreneur needs to think, because the users of the, of the PC web in the West, us, right, do not understand the users of the mobile web in Africa. So it takes an entrepreneur from Africa, like Herman was saying, to answer some of those, uh, those hard questions. This is uh, Fritz Kogwe. He's the founder of, of I Am Mobi, um, a, a really interesting website in, in uh, Cameroon. And all he does is build SMS services and also a marketplace so that anybody else can build their own SMS services off of his infrastructure. All the pundits of the West and you know, the, the Africans who have the nice phones you kind of don't want to think about this, right? They think, well, SMS is expensive and, and we don't have, there's no future in SMS. Well, the, the problem is that, the, that SMS is now, okay? So he's got to answer that question. Like, how do we deal with the now? Not three years from now, when SMS might be gone, but now. And so he builds services for that. And it's, a, it's, an, it's another interesting thing. When I saw him go up against a bunch of South Africans in a startup, uh, competition, he didn't do very well because all the investors were coming from the West and they didn't get it. Um, so there's, there's major hubs of technology in Africa. You know, so Accra, Lagos, Nairobi, uh, Cape Town and Joburg, Cairo. 
And you have to have a certain amount of critical mass to get there. And, and the, the important thing to understand is the success stories that we hear about, let's take Kenya again, for example. You've got Impesa, you've got Virtual City, you've got Craft Silicon, you've got Three Mice, you've got Seven Seas, you've got Ushahidi. Um, you know, we've been the success stories that have come out of this, of this space, but there's all these other guys in the middle who haven't quite made it yet, right? These, and it's all started down here at the bottom, right? You've got to have uh, this bottom of this pyramid. I don't like the BOP language, but for me, I use it in this context. Uh, the bottom of our pyramid of technology in Africa means that if we want to grow the top, if we want to see more success stories, guess what? We have got to grow the base of that pyramid. We have to get more money invested into risky startups, just like you find here in Cambridge and Silicon Valley, places like that. This is one of our biggest challenges, okay? We need more seed capital, we need more angel funding. It's not that we don't have money in places like Accra and Nairobi, there's money there, but it gets invested in land, it gets invested in new buildings. And that's smart too, right? But it's not, it's not looking here. Um, one of the big things we're doing around that is we're running an event this year in June 14th and 15th called Pivot 25 in Nairobi, and we're bringing in 25 companies from all over East Africa. There is over 90 applicants, and 25 of them made it, and uh, they're just going to show you what's next in the mobile space in East Africa. And they come from Rwanda and Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and uh, if you have a chance and you, can, and you can make it, I would suggest you come. Finally, I think I'm right on time. Uh, this is the future of, of African technology. And if you blink, you will miss it. Thank you.